Welcome everyone to episode 179 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I am joined in this episode by Google's Lawrence Maroney, uh, AI uh, 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 lead at at Google. He's responsible for uh, uh, the, Lawrence. the 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 word is the word is. I'm I'm lost on the word right now at this time. It's uh, AI advocate. That's it. AI advocate at Google and Stargate executive producer Robert C. Cooper. Can you can you tell them I'm excited for this show? Uh, before we get started, if you enjoy content like this and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal to me if you click that like button. It makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm. It will help to con- uh, the show to continue to grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon and giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes and clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few weeks on the dial the gate and gateworld.net youtube channels as this is a live show our uh youtube moderators are in the chat right now uh waiting to receive your questions the last third of the show will be getting to those until then we have a, a fairly structured program there's going to be some room for us to uh, um, to derail a little bit here because this is this is a wide territory of information so we're going to see uh, where this goes my guests today are Stargate uh, executive producer Robert C Cooper and AI advocacy lead at Google Lawrence Maroney gentlemen thank you so much for being here it is a pleasure to have you both live it's lovely to be here thanks David yeah, yeah, lovely to be here. Thank you. Um, uh, the scales are definitely tipped in terms of uh, educated expertise. Uh, <laughs> Lawrence, Lawrence's favor on this conversation. Well, this but is. I, uh, go ahead. Well, Lawrence. I'm just geeking out because Robert is here because I spent many years like watching TV screens with like you know made by Brad Wright and Robert C. Cooper on it. You know that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm just excited to be in the same room as Robert. Well, uh, virtually. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Lawrence, can you uh, give us a, a, a brief overview of who you are and um, your your work in this uh, field? Sure. If you don't um, mind. Uh, briefly, uh, my job is and, and my passion is really around AI advocacy. And what that really means is um, I like to call it informing and inspiring the world at scale around the possibilities with AI. Uh, so that involves a lot of education, book writing, uh, working on cool projects, And as well as like kind of understanding what the world is doing and what the world needs and then bringing that back into the mothership uh, to help us build a better product. Wow. Okay. And uh, Robert, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what it is that you hope to um, uh, continue to do with the work that... Uh, you continue to write in uh, in this world of artificial intelligence, or excuse me, in this in the world of science fiction. Uh, then let me back up here, Robert. What 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 are you excited to have about discuss about this conversation? Oh man, there's so many. I can't. But make that's not a short answer. We'll get into that as we get going in the conversation. Um, you know, uh, uh, a number of the shows that I'm developing right now mm-hmm. creatively are about the future and i we talk to experts i talk to other writers um it's it's kind of unsettling and shocking how quickly things are changing because you know we would set something in a version of of earth in 2035 and then we go wait a minute how that's not it's not even close to what it's probably going to look like given the speed with which things are changing right now and and uh, that's a little obviously frightening, um, and we'll we'll sort of I'm sure hopefully unpack that why and whether we actually need to be as as frightened as some of us are. Um, but yeah, we're you know I have I have another show that uh, we we've been working on that's set in 2050, and and what does that even look like? You know, how do we what interaction with technology will exist then and and uh, the nice thing about Stargate was it was it was set today in the current mm-hmm. world. You could sort of it was about our misunderstanding or our growth to understanding advanced alien technology. We were the sort of children in the mix trying to figure out how this all powerful stuff worked um, to to defend ourselves and hopefully uh, you know make the world better. 
Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting for me from a creative standpoint. Also just curious and hoping that I still have a job uh, in a few years, um, you know, wondering whether or not I'm going to be replaced by AI. And, and, you know, I've heard a lot of stuff too about, uh, you know, what does that future in the far future look, look like? And I, and I'm curious to talk a little bit about that too, because I think, um, the more optimistic or positive side of the future is that, you know, humans will stop having to worry about the day to day of our survival so much and start looking at ways to fulfill ourselves as people. So what is, what does that look like? That's another, you know, really interesting topic for me. So Lawrence, uh, we're getting all that. If yeah. you could, if you could hear some of the conversations that that Robert and I have have had about about this particular subject, it, it sounds like a, a couple of Debbie Downers, yeah. uh, just <laughs> expressing our concerns. Well, let me let me just let me just start by saying, Lawrence, my advice to you uh, and to the company you work for is um, don't use the word mothership. Uh, <laughs> that is it is typically a good sign that something bad is going to happen when science fiction <laughs> mentions the word mother I should it, this is probably the wrong time to say that our internal compute systems we actually call borg <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> jeez lawrence this is probably going to get me fired but <laughs> <laughs> um we there has been one of the reasons that I wanted to have this discussion now is not just because it's it's AI is in the 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 zeitgeist more now than ever. Um, the I had a uh, uh, a lot of times I spent a lot of time uh, watching a lot of YouTube content. And I was hearing people talk about Bing, uh, Microsoft's Bing's AI. And they were having discussions with this thing. It's it's a it's an offshoot mm -hmm. of the technology that that ChatGPT is based on, if if I'm understanding it right. And they started having really just users and users ha started having really intimate discussions with this thing. It was telling them, you know, my my name actually mm -hmm. isn't Bing; it's actually Sydney. Sydney, yes. And they go on and on about. Uh, they continue to talk with this thing, and it says, you know, I'd rather, you know, I want to be a, I want to have a body. I I don't want to be disembodied, and frankly, I don't want to keep on listening to all your questions. I want to stop that. And <laughs> this thing apparently, and I've seen whole streams of conversations of this thing berating and antagonizing users. And calling them names and threatening them, and I was like, I I couldn't be, I couldn't believe it. I could I mean I figured in my lifetime we'd be having you know discussions like I've I've been anticipating I'm 40 this year I've been looking forward to this all my life, but the velocity at which something like that happened, and then I thought to myself, does it make a difference if it's real or not? If it says it wants to do these things, and if it's plugged into certain extremities where it could act on it, say like the rumba in my home or or at some point when I'm an advanced age, uh, uh, an Android helping me in my house, could it not act on these things if it wanted to? And how do you feel about where this is going, the velocity of this development in recent times? Have you been anticipating this very thing happening about now or do you, did you not anticipate it happening this quickly? So in, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Um, I think the thing that was unanticipated was how people react to the type of content that's produced by these engines. And let me just take a step back for a second to describe Please. what these engines actually yeah. are and what they actually do. Um, like you're, you're, you're talking about things like will and intent. Uh, there's no will or intent there, despite the words saying that. And I'm, I'm just going to go into like using GPT yeah. as an example. So yeah, I, was, uh, I was actually going to say, sorry to interrupt you, is yeah. it's specifically, particularly in large part because of science fiction, we also tend to anthropomorphize things. Yeah. Um, you know, please explain specifically what the difference is between a linear AI, essentially, and, and a limited AI, and what people I think are assuming this is, which is an, an you know, 
an AGI, right? Which is a artificial yeah. general intelligence, which is nowhere, we're not even close to that, right? Not, not, not even close. And it, it, it's, none, it's none of those things. And it's like, you know, it, it, it's at best, it's the hello world of AGI. And it's many, many, many um, orders of magnitude of complexity removed from that. But let me explain what it actually is um, to just try and level set a little bit. Like you mentioned Please. GPT. Um, so GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformers. And I'm going to start with the T, which is transformers. Um, so the idea behind T is that it's a machine learning methodology that allows you to turn one sequence of words into another sequence of words. So, for example, if I say the words, if you're happy and you know it, what would you say next? Clap your hands. Clap your hands, right? So your brain has a transformer in it that's transforming that sequence of text, if you're happy and you know it, into clap your hands. Um, so, um, and I'm, I'm assuming Robert in Canada, it's the same thing. Um, I gave this hey, talk in Japan yeah. last week and nobody knew. <laughs> like, clap your hands. I had to use a Japanese nursery rhyme and the Japanese nursery rhyme worked great. Uh, but the, you know, so, so the idea there is that that's what a transformer is and that's what a transformer does. It's very good at learning sequences and how one sequence turns into another sequence. And then a transformer can be trained on tons of words and tons, a corpus of text from the internet. And like, it will see things like if you're happy and you know it transforms into clap your hands or okay. it was the best of times transforms into it was the worst of times. And it was transformers that I used when I was building the Stargate AI scripts, right? Okay. So I trained a transformer on everything Jack O'Neill said, on everything Sam Carter said, all of those kind of things. So that, you know, if you see something in a script, how would Jack respond to it? Um, so then what will happen with that transformer is that if you give it a bunch of words, um, it will calculate the most likely next words to appear in that sentence. Um, so it's obviously it's easy if I say if you're happy and you know it because there's millions of instances of clap your hands. But if there are more complex phrases, you know, like, I don't know, write an essay about why Homer Simpson is the father of the modern Internet. You know, if you say that to chat GPT, it's then going to calculate what's the next likely word to appear after that string of words and then what's the next likely word after that and then what's the next likely word after that and so on so that's the idea of a transformer um the p uh in p is pre-trained where the idea like again i said there's a massive corpus of text that the internet has been pre-trained uh these transformers have been pre-trained with it but the key is the g and the g is generative in other words, it makes stuff up. It's not doing factual things. It is generating by calculating statistical probabilities of words. And there's enough words on the internet and there's enough, um, or should I say, there's enough words in the corpus that it was trained on. And there's enough um, uh, parameters within the size of the transformers. It's like 375 billion parameters for it to be able to detect patterns amongst all of this text on the internet or all of the text on the corpus that it was trained on, I keep correcting myself, sorry, so that it can do that statistical calculation of the next likely word. So then when you're, um, and then overlaid on this is like some stuff to make it more semantic, to make it more uh, grammatically correct, to make it feel like a conversation and a chat. So then when you start talking with this kind of thing, what's going to happen is the more words it produces, the more likely it is that those words are less connected with the prompt that you've given it. Right. You know, like, for example, if I say if you're happy and you know it, you'll say clap your hands, you'll get those three right. But what's the next word? And what's the next word after that? And what's the next word after that? And you'll begin to see different people will deviate um, at that point right. in the same way as these statistical engines will deviate. So the point that what I'm trying to drive here is that no will no intent we're anthropomorphizing this thing in many ways we're failing the turing test not the machine you know when we do that type of thing and um and so the fear that starts creeping in when people see conversations like the ones that you mentioned um that fear is generally unfounded uh because there's no will or there's no intent uh behind this thing it is just squirting out words uh based on a statistical model but we've uh, so all seen the movie her yeah. and and we are well maybe not everybody saw that movie but but my favorite uh, movie i love it yeah it's a great well film. you know it is and it 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 works into your psyche as what to expect and those expectations are not should are not really faulted in somebody who is not as uh you know if educated say as you are to what the reality is so they're just looking at the forward-facing illusion and yeah. uh and having you know to discern which is 
a huge problem. You know, I think that is the biggest problem is that we have a disconnect between the magicians and the audience. Mm -hmm. And I think my person, part of my concern is what does it matter so much what it knows and does as much as what our reaction to it does to us, you know, and how we, we perceive well, it our, in the process. Yeah, but that's, but that's partly communication, right? Yeah. So, so in other words, again, I'm simply putting in language that's related to what I know. And that is we have historically had an understanding that when something is a documentary, it's labeled as a documentary and we react to it differently than a drama. And that's not to say those reactions aren't similar biologically. We have emotional reactions or we feel pleasure or we feel anger or all those things, but psych psychologically and intellectually, we react to them differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I go back to the fact that we don't have a label or distinction yet on the communication we're getting from the corporations about fiction and fact and how it's being generated and how it's interacting with us. And we have developed certain cues on how to do that with people. But, and, you know, and from thousands of years of interaction with people and we fail at it still all the time. But now we're dealing with in the last, probably what, you know, you put a time frame on it, two decades, our brains and our kids' brains are now having to adapt to a whole new mm -hmm. test of that capability. And it's being we're being preyed upon, I think, by by these technologies and and taken advantage of in ways that we can't even really fathom. And it's coming out in in these misunderstandings, these mm -hmm. kind of, oh my God, I felt creepy because it it told me to leave my wife. Well, <laughs> yeah. that that wasn't the problem. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's that level of um, misunderstanding can be concerning. Um, and I always liken it to, do you remember those, um, you've probably seen those videos when people first saw moving pictures. And there's like a scene of people in a movie theater and there's a train coming towards them and they all jump out of the way thinking right. that it's real and the train is going to crush them. In some ways, I see this to be the same type of thing. Um, it may be moving faster um, than moving pictures did. Uh, but over time, as people got more exposed to it and people understood what it was, they're not jumping out of the way of the train anymore. Um, right, right. Really but you had labels at the beginning of movies, too, for a very long period of time where and we still do in some cases, you know, that inform people about what they're watching in all the, all kinds of respects. And you don't have that now. You don't know whether something and that the, the more I say a deep fake gets realistic and the less we know about what is real. Um, you know, I feel like there is a certain amount of responsibility to mm -hmm. on the creators to indicate that and and or, you know, regulators to to interfere. But but before we get into all that, I really want I would love you to go back to the second part. You explained the uh, the limited AI, which we're dealing with now, which is almost more the illusion of intelligence through complicated mm -hmm. populations. What is AGI and 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 what is the barrier to getting to that that we're working on? I think, I mean, ask 10 different people, you'll get 10 different answers, first of all. Um, and I'm personally not really a believer in AGI because it's something that I think is fundamentally misunderstood. Um, I'm going to start with the I in intelligence, that even when it comes to us trying to figure out what actually is intelligence, you know, I'm going to give my definition of it. And that is intelligence is basically how a conscious being interprets data. And, and is able to use that data to make a prediction about either about that data or about the immediate future. Like, for example, intelligence isn't necessarily a human attribute. My dog is intelligent. You know, if my dog sees me holding a ball and moving my hand in this way, it knows I'm going to throw the ball and it predicts that and is running in that direction. So when we look about intelligence that way, then we think, OK, what is artificial intelligence? And that's when we try to simulate how a conscious being will react to data with a computer. And I'll mention the word simulate and definitely underline that. And you use the word magician earlier on, and that's the perfect analogy in my mind, because magic doesn't really exist, right? We don't have magic wands and we say spells and that happens, but magicians do exist and magicians do it by making an illusion, by simulating magic, by fooling us into thinking something is magic. 
And in the same way, artificial intelligence is when we program a computer to respond to data in the way an intelligent being would. Now, when people then talk about AGI, in some ways, they're more talking about consciousness. You know, I'm, I'm going to call it synthetic consciousness as opposed to artificial intelligence. Uh, but consciousness is a lot more than just intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. You know, going by my definition of what intelligence is. So we need to be first able to understand what exactly is consciousness? What exactly is that level of self-awareness? What exactly are we talking about when um, somebody has values like David was talking about? You know, if this thing is generating words about not liking somebody, what does it take to leap those words into actually turning those into moral values, making decisions on those moral values, and then being able to act on those decisions? That's a lot of steps beyond just intelligence. Uh, so when we use the phrase AGI, it makes it sound like artificial intelligence plus a little bit, right? You know, we're adding one extra letter in and it makes it seem like it's a small jump from artificial intelligence to AGI. And that's something that I, you know, I definitely argue against that I think we're so far from it that we don't even have a definition of it. We don't know how to understand it or anything along those lines. You know, even just talk about artificial emotions. Uh, when we go back to storytelling, you know, Lieutenant Commander Data, right? You know, the whole story around him was he had intelligence, he could talk, he could walk, he could do all these things, and he didn't have emotions. And I, how do we even simulate emotions? How do you create artificial emotions? Well, and then from emotions. Yeah, he, he eventually, you know, yeah. yeah. It's a nice story device where you can put a chip in his head, but yeah. the reality is it's a lot more complicated than that. So, like, in, so in my mind, when we talk about AGI, it feels like we're overselling um, where we are today and being able to get to something like that. And when I see well, predictions, that's, and that, that's, that's even if you're trying to simulate human intelligence as opposed to a higher machine intelligence or something superior, like we. Yeah, again, emotion. What are we? We are a meat made computer that does calculations and through electrical, you know, exchanges, but but we have other things that affect that. In other words, our decision making or our behavior, our consciousness is affected by a whole bunch of other chemical interactions in our body that I'm assuming we don't even begin to know how to replicate in a simulated version of us so so how did how is how does how does being tired affect your decision making how how does the hormone imbalance that you have or a an injury that you have that is somehow affecting how you think or feel mm -hmm. um what we consider to be what makes us happy what makes us fall in love what makes us laugh are all things that are beyond just the calculations and permutations of what our brain is going through. It's how our brain's being affected by all those other factors. And mm -hmm. we don't even know how that works. I, I don't think there's anybody who can really tell us why we laugh at certain things and not others. Yeah. I mean, humor is subjective, right? Um, but you, you're touching on exactly the point there. Cause like, you know, the, that's coming from real intelligence to understand what is beyond just intelligence to make a conscious living being that has morals, that has standards, that has humor and all of those kind of things. But I'm talking about for the starting point of artificial intelligence, which is the sleight of hand in computer programming to make a computer respond to data in a way that an intelligent being would. Um, so like when I talk about artificial intelligence, let me give this the example is like, you know, if I asked you to tell the difference between a cat and a dog, Right. You would probably think about the ears. You know, the cats have those pointy ears. Dogs tend to have floppy ones, but some dogs have pointy ears. Um, and, you know, you would be looking at these things and picking out these features on these things and making a decision based on those. When a computer looks at a picture of a cat or a dog, it just sees pixels. It sees color intensities. When we talk about artificial intelligence and with computer vision, part of artificial intelligence, that's a sleight of hand in programming a computer to kind of emulate the way that we would do it, to find features, to pick out those features and to make a decision if something is a cat or a dog based on those features. You know, so, you know, really, really underlining artificial there because artificial intelligence isn't real intelligence in a computer. Artificial intelligence is simulating how a real intelligence works using a computer. And that nuance is very, very important because it's far more mundane than we actually think it is. Um, when we see the behavior and like going back to what David was asking about earlier on with chat, it's like, and when we, we respond to something as if it was real and as if it has motivation, we call that an emergence, <laughs> really scary word, I know. Uh, but the idea of like an emergence is like, it's 
it's where it's we are seeing something that actually isn't there mm -hmm. in the same way as when you see the magician make the coin disappear you believe the coin is gone and it's not like hiding in his sleeve or something like that um so th that's where i always really say like we have to underline what artificial is in all of these kind of things and it is relatively primitive compared to what we see in fiction and uh, sometimes, you know, I'm a science fiction fan myself, and it's uh, it, uh, to try and separate what we see in fiction from the how mundane reality is, um, is um, a really important thing. Because once we understand how mundane reality is, then we can start getting productive with it. Then we can start doing real interesting things with it. And um, I'll go back to something I think you said earlier, Robert, was um, if I give one example, was I worked a little bit on a project for uh, diabetic retinopathy where the idea is that um, you can train an AI on a retina scan and the retina scan, uh, we got like, I think about 30,000 of them at Google that we had doctors label with various levels of disease. And then you can train an AI to find the features that the doctor said, this eye is diseased or this eye is healthy. So then when you give it a new retina scan, um, it will say, it'll give you the level of disease and it'll give you a diagnosis. And that's kind of cool. Um, but where it became superhuman was um, as well as having the disease labeled on the images, we also had things like the birth assigned gender, uh, the age, uh, blood pressure and stuff like that of the patient. And we did an experiment to say, OK, a doctor can't see a person's gender from the retina because they're not trained to do so. They're trained to spot blood clots that would indicate a disease. But a computer doesn't care about these things. We just say, hey, here's the retinas of men. Here's the retinas of women. Here's the retinas of people with high blood pressure. Here's the retinas of people with low blood pressure. And can a computer determine the difference between the two? And the answer to that was actually yes. Um, it got it right about 97% of the time with gender. And uh, actually, age was another one that the mean average error age that it got was about three years. And if I, if, I, if I were to ask people to guess my age, like in the YouTube chat now, I bet they would be out by more than three years. But from a retina scan, there was something in the data that a computer was able to spot. So here's where, like I said, when we understand how mundane it is and how it really works, that's when we can start getting creative and doing really interesting things with it. Uh, and like in this case, right. to determine a gender and age from a retina. Right. So, so. You know, my my analysis of what we have now is is a very sophisticated tool. And the question is, how are we going to how is that tool going to be used? And, you know, uh, uh, enriched uranium can <laughs> produce a lot of very beneficial energy or something incredibly destructive. And mm -hmm. as a result of that, we have developed a lot of rules, some of which are not followed, but a lot of rules around how enriched uranium is, is used. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas we now have a whole bunch of people, in my opinion, running around creating enriched uranium and handing it out at the corner. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to run through, and I know David had David and I talked a little bit before this, we have sort of a small list of things that I think are potential you know, negative consequences of the creation of these types of tools. And I'm curious what the companies and what your impression is of the uh, institutional reaction to some of these threats are and how they may be addressed in the future. Um, sure. So if you don't mind, I'd like to. Dan, yeah, it's, please go for it. Yeah. I'd love to sort of talk about a couple of them. Um, so I guess the first one is, I mean, this, the, the, these are in no particular order, but I mentioned, uh, you know, deep fakes and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And that's on the surface, kind of a, maybe a playful one, but it has tremendous uh, economic repercussions. Uh, people's uh, copyrights are being infringed on your own personal identity is being infringed on uh mm -hmm. you know the art community is up in arms about you know fake art being created essentially ai art um what what do we think about that just in terms of a, an economic impact and and also the i guess the extrapolation of that sort of add another layer to it is uh, a tremendous amount of misinformation can become destabilizing to a society it can affect elections we've already seen that in its infancy and we're 
we're just getting started, you know? Mm. So how do you, how do you police that? I guess. Yeah, it, it's a tough one. I, I'll start by separating the AI generated art from deep fakes. Cause I think those are two different things. Um, so the deep fakes being able to fake somebody's voice or being able to fake somebody's face obviously is a very concerning uh, technology. Um, I've worked with actors while working on the Stargate project and almost everyone was like, you know, their, their business is their image. Right. Um, and somebody, if they were to deep fake that to endorse a brand, you know, that a, the brand that's being endorsed could be something the actor or actress doesn't agree with. And B obviously they're losing revenue. Um, and those are, I mean, just, sorry to interrupt, but those are evident, right? Mm -hmm. That that's, that's the, that's the big, easy, low hanging fruit of this conversation. Yep. It, it is, it is so pervasive though. Like I, you know, I see you're of an actress who, uh, uh, is, is, you know, her livelihood is doing, um, audio books. And now the company has taken her voice and is just doing the audio book without her, with her voice. And, and mm -hmm. she's not making a living as a result of that. And mm -hmm. what is her, you know, she doesn't have the resources to hire a legal team to fight, big corp you know like so yeah. the, it's a it's a wholly pervasive problem absolutely uh, and i mean there are many many individual cases and i think they all have different things but the one that you mentioned for example where somebody used her voice to create audiobooks um it's like who's at fault there i mean who's the one doing the wrong there is it the people who are creating the technology that makes this possible or is it the people who are misusing it right it's i, I hate to use the whole the, the argument which i disagree with but guns don't kill people people kill people argument uh, right. but it, it does feel like that one um you know so do we stifle technology Except creation when you put a, when you, because you know, of its okay, misuse? Let's, let's take a let's just slightly elevate guns to to a bomb Mm -hmm. which is a similar thing it's a it's a weapon that uh, you put it in the wrong person's hand and it might just go off it might not even be intentional mm -hmm. and then you have to say are is the maker of that irresponsible for yeah. having made something so dangerous but if, if I were to elevate like that, like you're saying, the idea of a bomb is that it's something that's supposed to explode, right? The idea of artificial intelligence technology is that it's not something that's supposed to be like uh, used for harm or for hurt. You know, right. I could argue how like easy a car, though right? is it right. for but someone it, to car, twist that into something like else? Car, yeah, and a car is absolutely not meant to mow down a crowd of people and and or drive 300 mm -hmm. kilometers an hour, mm -hmm. uh, and yet we need to put speed limits on cars and teach people how to use cars to get a license yep. there are there is a whole system in place for and i mean still we have accidents we put seat belts in them people still drink and drive but all those laws are there and but they, they none of them for right. for ai yet. and they took time to evolve right when first cars first hit the scene those laws didn't exist they sure. took time to evolve and they took time to come into place and as cars were misused then people responded to them like even seat belts are a great example right seat belts have only been a very a recent law right um so i think over time as a technology becomes more prevalent within society or pervasive within society and the misuse of technology becomes more pervasive inside society and then society reacts to control that and you know but it's not the job of the person who invented the car to come up with these laws to control the car um, well, or to okay, understand the use cases where people may misuse the car. Now, I, I, you, you know, know better than me. I have no idea. I, my, I, I, I believe I heard that Europe actually does have a, uh, a bit of an overarching AI law, a uh, set of rules or laws or or a, a charter that they've agreed to, and one of them is that under no circumstances is a computer allowed to imitate a person a human mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. so wow. that would in my you know understanding would make a deep fake illegal in under their laws right yes. so we have nothing like that in north america to your yes and, and and we should and um you know and uh, like i said it does take time for once society begins to understand how something can be misused it takes time for society to react to that what we can do as the people who create the technology is provide those guidelines. We can't, you know, if, if, if Google were to start making laws in Canada or in the United States, that would be a much bigger problem. 
Uh, but what we do is we have what we call AI principles that we create where the, these are the guidelines. We say, this is how this stuff should be used. This is how this stuff should not be used. This is how it can be misused. And you, you need to be aware of that. But we can't dictate how people would are, are, you know, are allowed to use something. That's the job of the law of the land. We can guide and we can advise. And that's what we've been trying to do. Right. Well, there's a couple yeah, of issues yeah. with that, though, if, if you don't mind. I mean, it, sure. you, re you released the tool. Um, for instance, like, uh, well, for, for one thing, you know, uh, you've, you've got piracy of movies and films. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I can access something in a different country um, that is illegal in my country, but is not illegal over there. And I have the tool of the Internet to extend my arm and grab it. So it doesn't necessarily matter if it's, you know, a, if it's region uh, uh, specific to me or not, if I have another tool that I can use to go and pull it from somewhere else. So, um, so let me just be a little bit clear, though, here is that when we talk about releasing a tool, um, we don't build tools for deep fake or anything like that. We build technologies and we build technology platforms and I can see where people can misuse those technologies to build tools themselves against our guidance and potentially against the law in the same way as like, you know, to go back to Robert's example of a bomb or of enriching uranium, you know, the people who've created, who made scientific discoveries about splitting the atom and who published papers around that were the ones who were kind of saying, Hey, this is possible. This is how these mm -hmm. things work. And that's what we're doing. If people chose to do that to, you know, create energy on the one hand or bombs on the other hand, that's not from the scientists who made that initial discovery and who kind of, you know, released the idea and the concept of science in the same way as we're releasing the idea and the concept of artificial intelligence and algorithms that can be used to program computers to react intelligently to data. So I think, you know, there's um, choosing responsibility for how people misuse a thing really in my opinion at least has to fall on the person who misuses it well, okay, I, but, but if we but, were to release a deep fake tool tomorrow i would quit on the spot because that's just not what we do and that's not how we do things well okay but then let's not i'm not i'm not necessarily targeting google entirely yeah, yeah. I, yeah, also, no, that's, I don't want that that's to come not, out this way yeah. that's not that i also have to push back and say that's not entirely true because and i'll again i'll use the example of facebook where you know i don't think uh, the creators of Facebook intended for it to be used as a tool uh, of to disseminate misinformation to sway mm -hmm. an election. Mm -hmm. But once it became obvious that that was happening, they took it took a lot of institutional pressure for the people at Facebook to say, yeah, we're going to step in and change mm -hmm. that in any respect. They didn't think it's like, well, it's not our problem how our users we're just the facilitator of the technology and our users are just using it the way they are except they built it in such a way that harm could come and yep. and i know that sort of seems like well that's not our fault i'm actually kind of just curious whether the conversations go on at google about some of the issues because like let, let's take the algorithm that is demanding your attention at youtube and and causing your frankly your brain to change in a way that we don't really understand how that's going to impact us going forward in the future but those those are commercialized ways of uh affecting us for profit and and that is beyond simply just releasing technology into the world to be used however mm -hmm. somebody wants that is that is a commodification of our physiology so um let, let me answer that in two ways uh, first of all the first part of the question are these conversations happening the answer to that is absolutely yes um, that's why we've produced what we call our, our ai principles and secondly like when it comes to things such as you know we've been talking about chat and chatbots and all that if you go back a couple of years you will see that we were the first um, and the t in transformers was actually invented by us uh, we were the first to do these things. And our CEO, like at Google I.O. in 2019, I think, had a conversation with the planet Pluto um, because we turned Pluto into a chatbot using this technology. But we decided not to release it to the public because of the fear of misuse. 
you know, so we do um, very much care about these AI principles and making sure that when we release things that they have safeguards and they have rails. Uh, but just like you have rails in the Grand Canyon, it doesn't stop somebody jumping over them, right? So mm -hmm. that'll be the first part. Uh, the second part, of course, then is like when you talk about recommender systems, like you find in YouTube or on online shopping sites and all of that kind of stuff. I'll honestly say that I don't know enough about them to have an opinion. Um, I obviously I'm a user of them the same way you are. And, you know, when I when I use YouTube or if I shop on online sites and I see stuff that's recommended to me, sometimes it's stuff that I want. Sometimes it's stuff that, you know, has I don't know why it recommended the thing to me to begin with. I always like to tell a funny story in this case where um, I, uh, I have a pretty large backyard back here. And I had a lot of uh, aphids eating a lot of my plants and I wanted to control them without using uh, insecticide. So uh, one thing I did is I went down to Amazon and I bought uh, eggs for uh, praying mantises. And uh, so I, I live in the Seattle area and praying mantises can thrive here. And I hatched these praying mantis eggs and I released them into my yard to see if they would control the mosquitoes and the aphids and all of that kind of thing. And they did great. But you should have seen my Amazon recommendations after that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they must have thought I was running some kind of a zoo. Well, know? and I mean, in the in the I guess worst case scenario of these uh, things, it's it's it it's it's actually changing what you want. Like you say, well, that was something I want, but what you wanted has been affected by the hours and hours on those screens that you've been altered by. So there's. There's a manipulation there and that these are just going to get more and more sophisticated. You know, I heard recently on a podcast, one suggestion that, you know, you're going to you're going to be walking around in the metaverse and you're not going to know whether the person you're talking to is a real person or not. And you may form a relationship with them that seems really sincere and and in fact is is equivalent to a real life friendship for you. It's mm -hmm. providing all kinds of stuff to you. And then two months later, it's recommending that you, you know, buy Coke instead of Pepsi. And, <laughs> and you don't realize that, in fact, the whole time, that's a bot that's been programmed to sell you something. Condition you. Condition you through friendship to choose one product over the other. And and I think that's, again, uh, you know, we don't have necessarily the capability of seeing through that because the technology is so sophisticated because the the tools are so advanced the 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 company that released this is not at all about google specifically lawrence you you are mm -hmm. a, a, a cog in a larger system and i'm going to go back to the 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 earlier argument the the, the company that released 3d printers i'm sure had no idea that someone was going, well, I'm sure they suspected that someone was going to come along and start 3D printing guns with them. Mm -hmm. The technology exists to do that. And it doesn't necessarily matter what the intent of the company is when they birth this thing into the world. Right, it now except, exists. Yeah, except David, the difference there, I mean, just to step in on, on uh, Lawrence's side of it, is that printing a gun and then using that gun mm -hmm. in in many cases would be illegal. Mm -hmm. And the person who did that would go to jail and, and had nothing to do with the 3D printer. The 3D printer in that instance was used wrong. Right. And 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 and, and, and there are laws to prevent that. Right. Well, half but of my I family comes from Chicago and the number of people who are killed in that city every weekend are killed by people who don't care about the laws. The technology right, exists but, for but, them to obtain that. Right. But but in that case, there's a benefit to the 3D printer. Right. And there are laws in place to control the negative impacts. I'm saying that there are no laws yet to control what is potentially the nefarious use of the tool, the equivalent of the 3D printer in the AI tech world. So the AI tech is being released. And again, I... I'm not putting the entire onus on Google mm -hmm. to do this themselves. I'm saying the world, some some form of the world, whether it's through the people we elect and then institutional uh, laws, law creations, or some, you know, collective of companies that gets together and says, "Hey, for the good of humanity, we shouldn't do this, this, and this." Um, but I feel like there's a race for for money, essentially, for for the economics and for to be superior to have the control of the 
of the full situation that is leading to this disregard for that sort of thing. Like, I, I'm curious what your take is on um, like self-driving cars, right? Like to me, what we have here there is a product that's being released that has a essentially built in moral code that, that I don't even know if we have people who can figure out what the various permutations are of the moral decisions a self-driving car has to make. And yet those are getting released in, into for use into society as some sort of weird experiment uh, and who who has actually been through that code to say, uh, yeah, that's not that's not the way people would really generally want that to go. Uh, it, it would choose to kill this person over that person or what? Who's regulating that? No one at this point, as far as I can tell. Yeah, nobody is regulating. And to be honest, that's also why it's taking so long for these things to come out, because everybody's trying to get it right. Um, I mean, I saw my first self-driving car over 11 years ago. Um, on the roads in California. And I was on a bicycle beside one at a traffic light. And I, I have to say, I was very scared. Uh, yeah. uh, but it was like, it, it. but that the technology was there, but they're not commonplace on the roads yet for that very reason that the people who are building them are trying to be responsible about their rollout, about how they're used. And even today, there's still very, very limited use of them for that reason. Um, well, it's so, nice not uh, but, to get sued into oblivion. Well, well, I mean, that, that's, that's the byproduct you know. of, um, you know, something going wrong. I don't think the, the the motivation is about being sued. I think the motivation is to prevent the thing being wrong. Um, the, the, you know, being sued, like I said, is just a byproduct of that. I think, you know, just going back to something, though, that Robert, you were saying earlier on, and I just completely agree with, and it's like, when I think about anything coming out into society that can be a potential danger to society, generally we don't understand what that danger is until somebody misuses it. Like, you know, uh, cars that don't have a speed limit, you know, that kind of thing that can be used to mow into a crowd. Or uh, one that I remember years ago when I lived in the UK that it was very fashionable to have bull bars on the front of a car. You know, those like uh, iron uh -huh. things that, uh, and then it turned out that when people, when cars hit pedestrians and they had the bull bars on the front of the car, that the pedestrians are more likely to die. And then these things became um, regulated and became constrained. Um, but, you know, in the beginning, the intent for putting bull bars on the front of the car was to protect the driver of the car. And then when they realized that, you know, the implication of that was, you know, pedestrians are more likely to die, then the regulation happens. Society tends to react with regulation. And I don't think, and it's the same with any technology, right? You know, it, I don't think this is something that should be limited to AI or any other new technology that's coming down the pike. Um, so that'd be the first thing. But, and then also, as you were saying that what should happen is the people who know this should get together and should be providing that level of guidance. And that's the idea behind the AI principles. So we publish AI principles to say, like, here's how they should be used, here's how they shouldn't be used, that type of thing. I'm going to, I'll put a link to them in the in the chat when we're done here so people can read them for themselves. Um, Perfect. But I think that's generally what happens in society is that it does evolve over time to react to new things to make sure that people are protected. Some countries do it better than others. Uh, you pointed out already Europe uh, is probably ahead of others in that case, um, in the same way as Europe is ahead of, like, North America in terms of labor laws and in other things to protect the individual. And I just don't see this being something that's significantly different. Um, and then go, to go back to the 3D printer example, David, um, you know, it's, it, it's, you can ask the same question about any technology mm -hmm. and we could end up in a situation like, you know, if a technology has a potential for misuse, should it be released? But then we'd be back in the stone age, right? <laughs> absolutely. Know? Absolutely. And I'm not arguing my, my, I think the thing that I'm just trying to illustrate for the audience is awareness that that once something mm -hmm. has been um, real, <laughs> I feel like I'm Jeff Goldblum at Jurassic Park or Ian Malcolm. You know, <laughs> scientists are just because you can't do it doesn't could. mean you should, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. At, once yeah. intent of any of these companies is one thing. The, the mm -hmm. use of the product into into whatever a person wants is the other. And I think one of the things that we've been dancing around in this discussion is, you know, a, a part of the issue is, you know, what is whatever this this intelligence is, whatever it actually is, is one thing. But what we take away from it and do to ourselves and do to each other with it as a mm -hmm. magician is also something else. Yeah, well, absolutely. Let me 
let me uh, let me change the subject just a little bit. Um, the next thing on my list in terms of the impact is uh, maybe a simpler, dumber question. Literally, is AI making us dumber? Like, is mm. is it? Are we actually getting stupider because this illusion is filling in for us and doing work that we should be doing ourselves with our brains? So, so if you don't exercise. You lose muscle, mm -hmm. you're not as strong, you know, you're not as healthy. The brain is the same. And by having a machine do everything for us, are we getting dumber? Are we not able to then learn and think critically and do the things for ourselves that we should be able to do? I, I mean, I think generally people getting dumber predates AI. Um, I think. Oh, yeah. Easy I mean, access... I could never have done math without a calculator for yeah. sure. You know, right. there's no question. And, and, and I, ha I have personally say I've noticed over time, like, you know, I, I was a university student pre-internet. Um, so I had to go to libraries and look up books and look up indices and books to find the stuff that I want and spend many hours looking for one item of information. The Dewey um, Decimal that System, me right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> that helped me develop my brain in a particular way where yeah. now people can just open up their browser and have a search box and find yeah. it. Um, so yeah, and it's so it's like the easy access to information means that we work less hard to get that information. And if we're working less hard in our brains to get information, then there's certainly you can see there's atrophying of the brain muscles there. Um, I think that's independent of AI, uh, first of all. Um, and I think it's just, like I said, it's wide access to information. The second trend that I've seen, and one that really fascinates me was that, you know, I was pre-internet and it was like, you know, science fiction, the, the idea of what we have today where we can open up a search box and search for something and find the information in every library in the world at our fingertips. To me, that was utopian science fiction um, that we could do that and everybody would be much smarter. Um, the world didn't turn out that way. But then the next step that's happened, and maybe you're seeing it yourself with the, the people who were born with this um, information and the, these tools available to them, is that um, there's so much information available that it's hard for them to filter out what you know it is that they need to find and what it is that they're looking for. You know, it's being able to read a thousand books at once. So which one do you choose? Um, and and then I've seen then the trend of people now is more towards actually asking. Um, and asking an individual, um, I, I'm, I'm like I'm on LinkedIn, and there's a hundred times a day people will ask me a question that you could find in five seconds by searching. Um, so again, that's showing a trend of how people interact with information is definitely different. Maybe we can call it getting dumber. I don't know, <laughs> you know that kind of stuff, or maybe it's yeah. Just I mean, I, I think that, that um, we we conflate um, memory with intelligence too much that's mm -hmm. not the same thing and oftentimes our measure of intelligence are like exams at school where the vast majority of what they're testing is your memory which is which is not not mm -hmm. intelligent that mm -hmm. that is something different our ability to problem solve is the critical part of thinking and and the science fiction dystopian lesson is that we, we rely on the machine to make everything for us. The machine breaks and no, we can no longer survive because we don't know how to make anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how to cook our food or get our food because it always came out of the machine. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how to, you know, everything, all the medicine that we had came out of the machine. And now the machine's broken and we don't know how to fix anything. The repository of knowledge is gone. Yeah, there was and a Stargate episode mm -hmm. like that called The Sentinel. I'm going to insert that right there. So... <laughs> So, I, I mean, that's the science fiction version, but that's the slow. I, I feel like, you know, you can say, oh, it's slow, but it's not that slow. Like, I think that this is this is happening to us very quickly where we are so becoming so dependent on. And look, don't get me wrong. Without spell check, I might not have a career. I might, you know, so <laughs> I, I do depend on it. And and uh, occasionally I even sort of set a clock where it's like I can't look this thing up. Uh, I can't go to my phone and I have to try and make myself remember the name of that actor who was in that thing. But, <laughs> but I, but I'm just worried that the people who seem to be paying attention to it and testing the way that brains are changing as a result of this technology are concerned. And I, I don't, I don't know if that's happening within the companies at all, or they're looking at what the impact is of having these devices. 
yeah, I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I can't really comment on that. But um, I, I, I mean, what I can say, though, just having been on this planet for over 50 years and seeing how things happen is that, you know, generally things end up self-regulating, that if something ends up being in a situation where it's destructive to itself, it has to adapt and it has to survive. You know, so I don't think that the dystopian science fiction, the the was it Wally of of the world where everybody yeah. becomes so dependent on machines that they, you know, that and then when they can't use the machines anymore, then everybody dies and atrophies. That in my opinion, there's still going to be the people out there who will profit from running those machines, and their profits will be um, at uh, in danger um, if uh, people are unable to use those machines anymore, and they have to adapt and thrive. And that's generally what has happened with technology since day one. So the, the, the example I just heard on 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 this podcast i listened to was that there is a breed of sloth that has become addicted to a particular kind of plant it only eats this plant and unfortunately that plant has had a physiological impact on them to the point where they can no longer reproduce so it's oh, no. essentially hurt their reproduction and so that sloth is becoming extinct because it got addicted to that plant and couldn't <laughs> stop eating it so i i just i mean Obviously, that's an overly simplistic example, but it is an example that exists in nature of a situation in which an organism can, in fact, be self-defeating because of its weakness in addiction to something that in that case was maybe natural or environmental, but in our case has shown to be prevalent in our species, that we cannot help ourselves when something that gives us too much pleasure is presented to us. I mean, I think the key difference between the sloth example and us is that the sloth was not aware um, that that was what was happening to the sloth. Well, population. that's what I'm worried about, though, is that we're not aware. That, that, but by that the fact that we, we're having this conversation. I well, think we, we, are. Are. We, are. we are. We are. We are. And I'm glad we are. But I'm not sure that many that that many people are, you know, like I, I don't know if people are as aware that they've become addicted or that they mm -hmm. don't care. You and know, their parents like, are even doing it. I, I've lost count of the number of times that I've seen parents stick iPads in front of mm -hmm. their of their six months olds to quiet them down. Rather than interacting mm -hmm. with them, they're rewiring their kids' brains to the point where when that kid is 20 or 30, they're going to have far more in, in common with that iPad than they are with us. You know, and, and again, I don't, I, we, David and I were talking about this before, is I don't, I don't, I don't think it's entirely fair to always demonize uh, the pharma industry, but there you have a situation where, you know, there's a, they create a, something that is in its basic principles supposed intended to be beneficial. And then a unintended consequence is that the drug is addictive in a way that is so insidious like Oxycontin that causes people against their will with conversation happening in society about how bad it is and then people just but people just can't not mm. take it and it kills them they're in such so, pain yeah well it they they are they are addicted they are they have been manipulated by an external uh uh compound an external concept that has profited a particular corporation at the expense of you know the person who you might you, you might say didn't know any better, but probably did and did it anyway. You know, like mm -hmm. that's it's a it's a it's a disturbing uh, feature of our society. And I think you also look at how social media and I, I sort of think there's a. Um, maybe a slightly unfair tie between the the technology company and social media, social media, there's a responsibility on the users to some extent, I agree. But the what it's done is create a tremendous amount of, of mental illness. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that is self-destructive in a way that again, I don't, I don't, I know the conversation is happening, but I don't know if the in you know the change uh, uh for the cause is really coming about. So so you have kids who are just looking at the world and feeling worthless mm -hmm. and uh but yet the technology doesn't change i was like I, you know i was i heard a stat i was stunned by um that that tiktok is uh, in america um 100 million users use tiktok for 90 minutes every day wow i mean that, that is 
Yeah, I mean, no. can you imagine how mm. how happy Netflix would be if they got that kind of viewership? Um, yeah, yeah. We'd have lots but, of new Stargate shows for sure. Oh, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm i like, I don't, I'm struggling to figure out intellectually what the solutions to these problems are because I do feel like there's a, there is a avalanche of negative consequences that, you know, I'm not sure just publishing principles mm -hmm. is compensating for. Mm -hmm. And yeah, again, I mean, I'm not aiming this at you. Sure, I don't mean, of course, I'm, of I'm course. aiming this at the world. Right. I'm saying yeah. here, here's our problem. And, and, you know, again, with the Facebook example, it took Congress to step in and say, you got to do something about that because there was suddenly the public perception that elections were being stolen by a foreign entity, you know, mm -hmm. a foreign actor. So um, I don't know. I don't know what the tipping point is for some place where we can come to to say we have to step in and, and do something about it. But you have the technologies moving so quickly and so becoming so advanced again not not in the agi world but but nevertheless the tools are becoming so powerful that i don't believe the vast majority of people really know how bad it is or how dangerous it, it can be so we're playing with fire that we don't really understand how much it can actually burn if, us if i may insert um i uber sometimes for uh for some extra cash on the side and routinely I will hear young people in my back seat who just met someone at their night out type in their name and, oh, there's so-and-so. Oh, they only have 47 followers. <laughs> and their perception of the person has yeah. changed based on their exposure to mm -hmm. um, how, how, other, how many other connections they made with other people in that specific piece of software. Now, mm -hmm. I think that one of the solutions would be to have all of these numbers hidden but it will remove the rat race for a lot of these companies who want you to start, continue to build on this uh, and network. And they're not going to do that because that's a, that's a profit motive. So that was an episode of dark mirror as well. Wasn't it? Where people yeah, like black mirror. Each yeah. Other Bryce Dallas on, Howard. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. And then, you know, China started doing, you know, the, the social credit score. Well, I mean, in a I'm very, very we'll limited here. way, I think I, th I think there's been a lot of propaganda about that whole social credit thing. It's um, it, it, the actual use of it is a lot less than we, we tend to have been seeing um, over here. Um, there's definitely a lot of negative propaganda about that. Do you think that um, we so should I, have something similar here? I don't think we should have something similar here. No, okay. um, I think we, there, there are obvious problems with how people are interacting with technology that we need to think and understand our way through. Uh, to be able to fix them. And I think we, you know, we are all beholden, not just technology companies. Um, uh, we're all beholden to come up with solutions for that. Um, you know, the, I think the problems are well documented. Um, coming up with the solutions are not so well documented. Um, the uh, like, as Robert, you just mentioned with the with the, um, the I think it was the Cambridge Analytica example that you were talking about with Facebook and how Congress stepped in. I mean, I think that's a great example of when something becomes disruptive to society, it is the job of government to step in. You know, it's the job of government to set speed limits. It's the job of government to, you know, say this drug is legal and this drug is illegal. Um, but we also in some countries, the United States being a great example of that, are I mean, there's a pressure for smaller government, right? You know, for less government overreach, and you know that the, the negative pushback if a government tries to do something to control something, um, you know, ends up being even more destructive. Yeah, uh, and so, look, we have so, a, we have an imperfect yeah. system of government too, where governments are influenced by lobbyists, and yeah. you know, important things don't happen because uh, of all of those special interests. So, so, so what is our job, you know, for those of us who have expertise in something is like, you know, we can be the canaries kind of uh, sounding the alarm. Um, but, you know, also I try to we try to be the owls, you know, uh, hooting that the dawn is coming and that, you know, there are um, I don't know. If, do you remember the TV show Millennium? Oh, sure. Remember the remember there were the two factions. It was the owls and the roosters. Sorry, mm -hmm. and uh, so like you know we can be the roosters, you know, saying hey the dawn is coming and warning people about this, and we can be the owls hooting in wisdom. Um, and so I think the lost my train of thought for a second, uh, but I think what I'm driving Fine. at here is is that you know that it's it's society's job to fix society. 
and you know some of the problems that are out there in society that we can best do that by raising awareness of the positive uses of something as well as the negative uses of something i'm personally somebody that tries to focus on the solution rather than focus on the problem and um so uh, yeah, all of the things that we've mentioned today i think are well understood problems it's a case of how do we squeeze society's square peg through the round hole of fixing it uh, and you know and then also deal with the complexity of different cultures and different countries and how they want to do that um and you know that that's a challenge that you know it's a massive challenge that all of society faces but i i'm generally an optimist that i think you know is the kind of thing that we can do um some things may get worse before they get better but i always like to go back to the example that i mentioned of the the original movies when you see a train coming and people getting scared and running out of the way and somebody could have had a heart attack seeing that we don't know um and then as robert you pointed out now movies have warnings but before the movie industry understood the potential implication of this stuff they didn't first of all and secondly before people really understood what was going on that they're just seeing an image projected 24 times a second or whatever it is um, a static image being projected to make it look like there's a moving thing you know until people understood that they were fearful of it and i think over time as people understand this stuff more um then the potential damage of it and the potential for people to question this stuff will go up and the potential for people to be, you know, like damaged by somebody misleading them will go down. Um, but the bigger challenge then becomes, you know, movies happened once and it took maybe 20 years, but as new technology is coming out all the time and there's all this adaption that needs to happen all the time, that's when it becomes a much bigger challenge. And I, I always like to, I'm, I'm going to scare you now. I'm going to give you my scary stat. Okay. Um, are you familiar with Moore's Law? Mm -hmm. No. Have you heard of it? Okay, so Moore's Law is uh, one of the principles of computing where it's, you know, the, the reality of it was the number of transistors that can fit on a chip halves every 18 months. Um, sorry, doubles every 18 months, which generally means that the computing power doubles every 18 months. So if you were to track, uh, and that's why we see acceleration in computing, right? Um, so like the, your iPhone 15 is much more powerful than your iPhone 10. Um, and so if you, I, I did a study once where I said, okay, what if we start Moore's law back in world war two with Alan Turing cracking, uh, the Enigma machine, and we give that the number one, right. And then we go forward 18 months, we double that to the number two. And then we go forward 18 months and we double that to the number four. And then we keep doing that. And you can go into a spreadsheet and do this. Isn't it like 32 say, okay. iterations where it's like infinity? <laughs> it's getting there but yeah so let, let, let me kind of then get, give another illustration and I'm, I'm actually working on writing a movie at the moment about a person who uses the specter of ai to overthrow the u.s government and i say it's the specter of ai rather than the reality uh, but one of the arguments that's made in this movie is um so then the 1980s if you remember the 1980s at the beginning of the 1980s computers were science fiction um at the end of the 1980s there was a computer on everybody's desk. Hey, remember, so if I go by the movie War Games, what's that? you remember the movie War Games? Oh yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, like, like think about the sophistication of that computer compared to what we're doing today. You know, it was like Pong essentially. Yeah. But so, so, so if I go by the Moore's Law number, like starting with Alan Turing with number one at the in 1980, and then I go with the Moore's Law number in 1990, so the beginning and the end, you know, and I subtract those to say, here's how much computing advanced in the 1980s, and I get a number. And now I fast forward to today. How often do you think we get that level of advancement, that number that was the entire decade of the 1980s? It's every three seconds. So the, the Moore's lower number of the entire decade of the 1980s were replicating every three seconds today, you know, and, and so that it, just showing that level of acceleration of technology is, is there and it's real. And it's like that's the pressure that's kind of driving a lot of the things that we spoke about today and a lot of the fear. Um, that, you know, we're talking about today because, you know, it can feel like this is a runaway horse, you know, and we don't know where it's going to go. Um, but in the 1980s, it felt like a runaway horse as well. Um, I, so I remember, you know, being a, a child in the 1980s and uh, there was a TV commercial in the UK. Um, I was living in Ireland. We got our TV from the UK and it was about robot arms. And, you know, they had car factories and robot arms assembling cars in the car factories. And for propaganda in favor of these robot arms, because everybody was terrified of these robots putting humans out of work back in the 1980s, they made this commercial of these two robot arms talking to each other. 
And then, of course, people thought that robots were real and could talk to each other and do all of this kind of thing. It backfired completely and everybody was terrified of this stuff. But it's the same fear that we're experiencing today. And, you know, obviously it's accelerated today, but it's still the same fear. Um, you know, Robert, you mentioned earlier on that, you know, is this thing going to put you out of a job as a writer? I was going to um, come I, back to that. Yeah, I would say, and I'll say the same thing to you that I say to computer programmers who ask me the same thing. And I'll say, no, it won't. But the person who uses it might put the person who doesn't use it out of work as a writer. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, in the same way as the mathematician who used a calculator would put the mathematician who doesn't use a calculator potentially out of job as a mathematician. Lawrence, I heard, um, I it, heard it, Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld said, uh, somebody asked him about uh, the uh, AI Seinfeld that was being you know, done online for a little while. And, and he said, well, I hear these, these computers are going to keep getting smarter and smarter and smarter. And he said, I'm not worried about my job because you have to be dumb to do what I do. <laughs> Right. And and you know, I mean, there's a there's a there's a point there, but also I think the to go back to your earlier explanation of what linear AI actually is, and maybe why it's it's failing in terms of things like humor or or what makes you cry, is that humor. I think what what humor is and what makes you laugh is your ability to fill in blanks, right? So, so a joke is about the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. And you, I think, I think laughter is kind of you being impressed with yourself at being able to fill in the blanks between those two points. <laughs> and, and so, and if the computer can't do that, mm -hmm. if the computer can't come up with that, those missing pieces because it needs all the data to fill in the blanks. That's something you are able to do through your life experience. Maybe one day it'll get to that point where it's able to fill in enough data that it's able to create that joke. But when you ask it to write a joke, it somehow just doesn't seem as yep. good. So when we were working on the Stargate AI stuff, um, one of the things that we wanted to do was a funny story and and to have humor in it um and the prompt that came from the fans was apparently an atlantis episode about a gate ship and you know the whole uh, play of words about the gate ship and so i was working with a, a, a gpt based so not open ai's gpt but something that i rolled myself but a generative pre-trained transformer to see what we can do about writing an episode and having humor in it and um, we, it, it, it's online, it's on YouTube if you get a chance to watch it. And the script that um, the computer came out with in the end was quite funny um, because, again, it was learning from existing written humor. And one of the things that turns out apparently is quite funny is when you repeat something, you know, and you repeat it for emphasis. Um, and in this case, it was, um, it was McKay wanting to name a ship, um, a gate ship. And then he wrote it on the wall. And then um, the, uh, I, I'm really bad. I'm sorry. I can't remember her name. He, the, the, uh, Taylor. Yeah. And I Taylor, am the first and then officer. the other lady, the, the, the lead, Dr. Weir. Dr. You know, Weir. Saying, you can't do that, Rodney. So he erases it and he writes it on the floor. And she say, no, no, you can't do that, Rodney. So he erases it and he writes it on the door. You know, that kind of stuff. And that kind of level of repetition apparently, you know, has been labeled out there. And there's enough text labeled out there to say repetition like that is funny. Mm -hmm. um, so the when we when we created that script, it, you know, it ended up doing that level of repetition. The rule of threes, right? Every, it, yeah, three yeah. times and, body, four times starts to lose. lose <laughs> yeah. uh, Actually, I think time. it did it. You, you could be right. I might have done it three times. Yeah, I need the to go rule of three is pretty, it's pretty well yeah. known. Um, um, the other, but then the, other the thing... real humor, sorry, the, just to, to wrap up that thought, the real humor then, though, came in with the people performing it. Um, mm -hmm. So like when David Hewlett read those lines, I mean, right. that's when, you know, I read the script and I'm like, yeah, this is quite amusing. But when David then read them and the other actors responded to it, then we could see like the value that they bring and the value that the humans bring to this thing. And it was just drop dead, wet your pants funny. <laughs> you know, so it's... Uh... The, the other Robert, thing, before uh... you jump on your thought, uh, we have to get to fan questions after this. Sure, okay. sure. Last, last bit was that the other, the other thing that I think drives humor is error. I think we find things that are wrong, funny. So even mm -hmm. to the point of if somebody slips and falls, it's like, that's not a normal behavior. And so we laugh at that. Mm -hmm. And so when a computer does something wrong, in a way, we're laughing at it, because it got it wrong. Like, that's, that's mm -hmm. what's funny about it is that's not the way it's supposed to be. So that's funny. 
So Lawrence, if we have enough instances yeah. like that where we've said something is funny, we can actually train a computer to replicate that. Right. Sorry, go ahead, David. No, Sorry, you're, so you're good. I wanted to, yeah. My job is in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no way, I, no way. You're too talented. Well, you know, you know, this like, uh, uh, sorry, David, one more little You're point. fine. Like, you know, there's, there's things like you look at uh, what's happening in the industry today, and, and uh, certainly the studios have kind of come out with what I think is intended to be the more politically correct, non-offending their current employees, artists who, who they make their living off of, uh, that they are supportive of all human generated stuff, and they're not leaning into this. But, you know, if, if, Three years ago, you had gone to a studio and said, um, what do you think about having 80% of your staff work at home? They would have been like, no, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. It would never happen. There's no way. But now it's like, wow, are we saving money by having everybody work at home? You know, like they don't know what's possible, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's the other thing that, mm -hmm. again, you and I kind of are looking forward and they probably are too and they're just not admitting it but there's a point at which a you're arming everyone you're democratizing the creation of of entertainment and you see it now with youtube maybe not on the same sophisticated level as a marvel movie mm -hmm. but that's not that far away when i see what's going on in the tech world in film and television and editing and visual effects mm -hmm. you know the idea, I said to my friend Lauren, who's a, a visual effects guy, um, uh, I want all those hours back watching guys put X's on the green screen, you know, or, or you know, or tracking. You know, I just want that those hours back and all the money we spent waiting for them, you know, to do that. So or even in the early days, the, the motion control was like insane, like on, on a show like um, uh Double Jeopardy, where we had to twin, uh, you know, all the, the team with their robots, it would take hours and the money it would like, you could literally do that now on an iPhone in five yeah. minutes and have it look better than what we did <laughs> over three days with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. So totally <laughs> now somebody will make a movie mm. with next to nothing that will hit the world and be a success. Um, I'll, I'll have to send you the, the I, I've been working on a short movie where it's entirely created by AI. So the scripts, the characters, every frame, the voices, everything mm -hmm. created by AI. Um, yep. It's really and people bad. will flock to it if only for the novelty <laughs> of, of seeing what it looks like, you know, you will do that, well with it. That's what I'm saying is put, put that, there are way more people who have talent for, mm creative creation than are than the industry is allowing yeah. to do it is giving access yeah. to and when you put that technology in their hands you're going to have mm -hmm. a flood of incredible content mm -hmm. that i think will change the way we not just the the platform that we use but the way we you know entertain each other mm -hmm. yeah I mean, there's a I, precedent in books, right? Once we move to ebooks from published paper books, that there's, there's a flood of new books and new authors on the market. There's a lot of garbage, uh, but sure. there's a lot of great stuff too. And, and I blogs, think there's a, there's a you, great what, precedent what, there. What yeah. digital blogs and Substacks have done to newspapers, like exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's coming for full motion video for sure. Yeah. Lawrence, so I'll, I'll send you mine, but it's really primitive. <laughs> it's I'd really love to bad. see it. I'd love to see it too, please. <laughs> sure. Before. I, the, the, the main character, I synthesized my voice to voice the main character and then deep faked my own voice to voice this main character. And then my wife didn't recognize that it was my voice. Oh, <laughs> That's wow. how bad this is. That's crazy. Well, like I said, when it's wrong, it's funny. So yeah. uh, there's still a value in it, right? Anyway, sorry, David. I know no, you need you're to do fine. questions. Uh, before, before the fan questions, I, I just want to ask your honest answer uh, as, as succinct as you can. If I were to put you in a time capsule and send you a hundred years into the future, what percentage of humanity do you think you would recognize? <laughs> Forty-two. No. Uh, 40... <laughs> I'm glad you get that reference. Of um, course, I get that reference. I've used that reference several times. <laughs> right. Um, I would say between ten and forty-two percent. Let's put it that way. 
I think I would recognize in the same way as like, you know, a, probably between 10 and 42 percent of humanity on the planet today would be recognizable to somebody from 100 years ago. You think the velocity will be equidistant from 100 years back no, to 100 years forward? Yeah, no, I think the, the velocity yeah. will increase. But I think also with the velocity increasing will also cause a greater separation, right? Yeah. The rich, the haves have more and the, the, the not haves have less um, kind of thing. So the, the, there will certainly be a recognizable subset of humanity. So you don't see technology being a great equalizer. You don't see us overcoming that. I see it raising the floor, um, okay. but I don't see it being a great equalizer. I think that the poorest person 100 years from now will probably be richer than the richest person today. Uh, but the distance between them and the richest person 100 years from now will probably be greater than the one of today. You think so? I mean, we've ha we've halved global poverty in the last 15 years. I mean, uh, 10,000 people a day are being brought onto the electricity grid. You don't you don't see that as as that, elevating that's people what I mean by raising absolute the floor. poverty. Oh, raising the floor. Yeah, that, up that's higher. what I mean okay. by actually raising the floor. Okay. But if you think about the richest today, the gap between the rich and the poor is much greater than it was, even though we've raised the floor of poverty. And I think that trend will continue. I see. My, my hope is that all this, um, all the negative consequences of, of AI could possibly be um, worth it if AI can figure out how to stop climate change. Mm. <laughs> because, because we may not even be here to to yeah. look at the at the difference if we don't figure that part out. And I'm hoping that these advancements in technology, all that acceleration, is going to make us smarter in ways that we need to get smarter. Yeah. Well, I there's agree. always the Thanos solution. So we just hope the the, the <laughs> computers don't figure that one out. Robot <laughs> elbows. Uh, at Lawrence, there's a lot to talk about AGI and fully sentient AI becoming a thing in the not too distant future. What needs to happen? What hurdles do we need to overcome before we're truly at AGI? Just a really small, simple question. Yeah, just really small. I think we, we addressed that a little bit earlier yeah. on. I think, you know, AGI is a little bit oversold. There's many, many hurdles that have to be overcome, not least just understanding how far we are along and understanding just intelligence, never mind everything else. Okay. Uh, yeah, I heard David, David yes, just please. as an example, I heard. Uh, a conversation, Lawrence, maybe you know about even this conversation better than me, but, uh, you know, one of the benchmarks has always been the game Go. Like they, they've always mm -hmm. had, had right. computer systems trying to beat humans at chess and then they moved to Go and they had created a system that was, I don't know, a thousand times better at Go than the, the best human. And yep. thought like that, that was playing a five-year-old, you know, in that game. And then recently human beat that computer at go because they figured out a one little trick that the computer didn't know how to get around mm -hmm. and didn't understand and then suddenly they could exploit it and so it's that level of we just haven't gotten to the point of actual learning it's still just simulated learning yeah, and, and it's learning from past data rather than to be able to predict the future, which is great for games like Go or chess or those kind of things. But it's not innovating to try and figure out something that somebody would never have seen before, right? You know, that's that's all you can do when you learn from the past. And um, and that's how a, an engineer, an, in, what's the word, ingenuity of a human uh, was able to be able to crack and defeat, you know, the thing, the Go that beat Lisa Dahl, the world champion. Um, the, but the, I think, the, again, that simulated intelligence is vastly different that when we talk about AGI, in many ways, you know, when we hear the term AGI, we're thinking synthetic consciousness as opposed to artificial intelligence. And, you know, I think, you know, just to understand what a synthetic consciousness would be is, you know, even understanding what it would look like, we don't have yet as, as a society. Yeah, I heard, I heard a number, somebody threw out, you know, 50 to 75 years is, is likely, not in our lifetime. Yeah. I, I, I've even heard the year 2040, um, people are expecting it um, to We're hit. Talking singularity? Name. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's, I, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm putting my foot in my mouth and saying, I think that's ridiculous. I, I don't think we're even close to that. But what I think we will be getting is more and more people believing that they're seeing you know, artificial consciousness or synthetic right. consciousness, just like what David was talking about earlier on with the examples of people chatting with uh, with Transformers. Well, your own company had this this guy still, I'm not, I can't think of his name, still swears up and down that that what was created, Lambda or something, somewhat, was was yep. sentient. He That's his belief based on his own experience. When we have people, you know, um, uh, saying that what they're talking to, they are convinced that it is real who are we to say 
that it's that it's not if that's their experience you know yeah i mean somebody's experience doesn't define reality right i mean people believe elvis is still alive <laughs> you know and he works down the local chip shop i mean uh, but that doesn't, bruce doesn't jenner mean die. bruce jenner to caitlin jenner i mean that's that's defining reality it's it's the, mm -hmm. the the question is how many of us are agreeing with that i think mm -hmm. that that really can define reality what whatever your perception is of someone may be one thing but if the society is telling you otherwise if we're saying mm -hmm. no you're wrong i think it can define reality so yeah, that, that's the lesson of the matrix, right? Perception is reality. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, when it comes to whether something exists or not, or whether something is what people claim it to be, mm -hmm. when it's been architected, to, artificially architected and engineered by humans to be something completely different, mm -hmm. I tend to trust the people who actually built it, as opposed to the person who's using it and bringing his or her own biases into that use of it, and then coming up with a belief um, yeah, I'm, that, so. I'm sorry, David, but I don't care how many people believe the Earth is flat. It's not going to be flat. <laughs> yeah. They don't make it flat by all believing that it's flat. They're just they are they are in a they are operating in an in an illusion or a delusion at that point, and they may be happy. Like I'm not judging them if they're happier mm -hmm. there or if it somehow changes their existence in a positive way, but it doesn't change the fact of the truth. I, I agree with that, and I also think that it would be foolish and and uh, uh, ignorant to say that uh, the the culture war isn't a real thing, and we're not all trying to figure these things out together, and that some people are saying that one thing is real and the other thing is not, and because you believe that and you don't believe that, I'm going to hate you for that. Well, so but partly I, again, I think it's I important to remember that we're all in this together trying to figure each of these different things out and that's, that's all that partly, I'm, and David, that's all that i'm because, saying because there's a social media technology is reinforcing our our desire to fight by rewarding right. it and, right. and we get reward for fighting and so fighting itself becomes the reality and right. it's not about what we're fighting over it's about the fact that we are now getting pleasure and reward and success from fighting and from winning out of that battle. And, and uh, that's to me, the problem is, is we've stopped worrying about what the fight is over and what the truth actually is. And we're just engaging in the fight. As long as we can come together as people and have discussions like this with, with the genuine pursuit of understanding th there's absolutely hope. Yeah. And, and it also those who learn from history or don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Right. And um, I'll cite an example of culture war, which is the words that you've used a moment ago. You know, I grew up in Ireland in the 1980s. And mm. if you're familiar with the history of Ireland in the 1980s and yes. the period that we call the Troubles, you know, these were things that went on for hundreds of years. And it was it's such a divide and such a toxic one that, you know, the so-called culture war that we're living in the U.S. right now is like a, you know, it's a it's a pancake fight in comparison. And, you know, it changed and it was fixed. And what en what ended up changing and fixing it were many factors. But the biggest one was an economic reality that when, you know, when the Celtic tiger roared because of the advent of the Internet and now people had jobs and people had homes and people could go to movies and they could afford to go out for dinner and raise families, then suddenly these differences between them were minimized to nothing. And it was an economic boom that kind of led ultimately to these troubles ending. And, you know, then this is one of the reasons why I'm very strongly advocating for AI, because I think AI can lead to a similar economic boom, not just in the United States, but beyond. And that economic booms like that have a tendency of fixing social problems. Oh, absolutely. I totally think that this is is solvable. I just I just don't think it can be dismissed out of hand. Absolutely. So, um, Sledge, should nothing new, we, this is something we've addressed, uh, you asked me, Lawrence, should nothing new ever be built because someone might use it for harm? It's the age old <laughs> it, question. What, what, one of my favorite TV shows was Battlestar Galactica. And if you remember the finale of that, they abandoned technology, right? You know, and it's a, and it, it, that, that is the trend, you know, that maybe people are saying we should abandon technology and go backwards and make life simpler. But I, I disagree with that personally. Mm-hmm. I think that will lead to more misery. Um, let me see here. Mac Boland's conscience. Haven't TV shows and movies been used to condition and change the minds of people? How do we decide what is right or wrong since right and wrong are subjective? 
I leave that. Well, one to I, I totally agree with that. I, I don't, I don't disagree at all. I think in particular, when you look at Hollywood, for example, Hollywood has perpetuated a myth for the better part of, you know, a hundred and something years that has been incredibly damaging. And it also contributed to the, uh, acrimony that we see today and the difference between the haves and have nots. And, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it was a, it was it actually the movie industry exploded because it was used as a tool for propaganda. Mm. And that is, that is pretty much how it blew up. And, um, and I think it's still being done today. And, and again, is the more sophisticated version of social media that causes people to devalue their own lives by comparison and live through, um, you know, vicariously through what they see on screen and feel less than because their lives don't match up or don't line up with the fictional story. So the, the, the happy ending is what we all look for the perfect, you know, the perfect relationship. And um, it's just not, it's not what we experience in life. And also Hollywood, you know, is, is a tool for normalization. Look at Star Trek with the original series, you know, you had, you had a Japanese and a Russian, you know, flying and navigating the ship. And so that's where the benefit is. Yeah. That's where the benefit is. So you have, you know, you have shows like, again, I just heard a fantastic podcast. Uh, my, my favorite is uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist mm -hmm. History. I'll give him a little plug on there. Is, uh, he, was, he did a breakdown of the impact, social impact of Will and Grace. And how exactly. That was, I was about to bring you know, up Will and Grace, change, Robert. Go ahead. Change. Uh, you know, people's perception. But again, you know, the way they looked at it and the way he admitted is that they they had to soften it to the reason that it did have that impact was because they portrayed a more accessible, softer version of the reality uh, because America wasn't yet ready to embrace anything more than that. If you uh, go back and read interviews from them at the time, people asked them, are you trying to normalize this? And they were like, no, we're totally not. And now today it's like, yeah, of course we were. And the society benefited from it. Well, well, but why so, wouldn't you be trying to normalize something that should be normal? Yeah, but, but you know some people like, think that it's normal and other people don't. But now, as I, I completely agree, this, it's important that we, we do normalize this behavior and that it exists. The, the question is how many of us agree that what something should be normalized? Well, yeah. Uh, anyway, I do think there's power that TV has for sure that TV and film has, but it is also largely contributory to uh, a lot of very negative uh, impacts in, in terms of people's perception of what life should be. So it's a very powerful tool that can be used, uh, both positive. Yeah, now, and now you're, yeah, I'm not, I'm not blaming, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Kodak Eastman for inventing film, you know, like it's, right. he, he, it's not his fault that, you know, it would be used to make pornography, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lock Watcher for both guests. Will I, will AI, do you believe be able to be used to create at minimum, for instance, chroma key background shots, or even possibly certain special effects, so that these things will be helping to reduce the cost of special effects in the industry moving forward. I think yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I was alluding earlier to a um, an AI based movie that I've been creating where. You know, um, I used a, a concept called stable diffusion, if anybody's familiar with it, where I created the frames as very, very, very simple animations. And then I used stable diffusion to replace the stick figures in these things with actual CGI figures. Um, and so, you know, and the entire thing then created by AI as a result. Um, and, you know, and that's just me working primitively on a single GPU over here. I'm not a professional FX person by any stretch of the imagination. And I think the sky is the limit for this kind of thing, um, that the generative AI for that kind of stuff at the very least is going to be really powerful for filmmakers. I Thank you for bringing up Stable Diffusion, Lawrence. Um, I, I just want to insert real quick before, Robert, you contribute if, if you wish. The, uh, Adam K. Hill, who... Uh, uh, 
is uh, my uh, AI artist on Wormhole Extremists. I threw an image of a Stargate and a Chevron at him for uh, for this episode, and I said, "Turn, take, unleash your AI program at this uh, right now, so that we can get an image for this episode that we're airing right now." And he took it and did a whole number of of changes to it uh, for this uh, particular episode. It's just, and he did it in less than like five hours. Um, but it's it's amazing technology, and I just it's I just showed very... it on screen for everyone to see. So. Oh, cool! I'll check it out later. It, yep. It's very rough around the edges. It's not ready for prime time yet, but we can see it's definitely heading in the right direction. Robert, how do you how do you see um, artificial intelligence well, I mean, facilitating again, your work? I think we've talked about it, but I, I again, better tools don't make you a better, you know, don't make yeah. you a carpenter, right? You yeah. know, uh, certainly it doesn't hurt. I've always I've always said that uh, you know it's all about the tools, but um, but you can see just tons of evidence out there that just because you you have the ability to to technically achieve something doesn't mean you're gonna touch people or move them or speak to them or tell a story that people care about. So mm -hmm. I think one of the satisfying things for me. Uh... There's a couple. It's, I haven't. I think. I think the consensus right now is something like Chat GPT. And Lawrence, you spoke to it similarly. It it cannot create anything novel. You know, it it just creates something, well, puts something together from other things that already exist. In all fair, in all fairness, that's what I do. I mean, right. uh, you know, I, I have to. I, I'm not going to speak for every writer, but all I do is is essentially regurgitate the things that I've seen in love, but I, I'm filtering them and putting them through some a, a, a process that hopefully uh, reflects my humanity and someone else's, someone else can identify with that. So there's a, the, the filter process is key. The, the actual process is not that different. I am still, everything I've done, you could probably look back at at some reference that i drew from in the in other films or television or in my life that i'm then reprocessing into something new so robert I, when i'm sitting and watching the fifth race as a 14 year old just hanging out at my dad's uh helicopter workshop you know at late at night and and jack comes back through that that gate and he says you know what we were talking about about that meaning of life stuff and everything else i think we're going to be okay and the message <laughs> that that hit me as a 14 year old boy you know I, I you can you can define it however you want but um i would say that a piece of of art like these series that you've created is far more than past experience pushed through a filter all right well i so. i guarantee you that almost in almost every case in the writer's room, I would be like, you know, like this. And I would say, I would use some movie reference of something that I loved and and say, we have to try and, you know, achieve that in yeah. some way with our characters in our world. So uh, I would, yeah, if I, if I had to, let's just put it this way. If I had to annotate everything that I've ever written, it would be an endless book of of uh, annotations yeah it's just a simple question of time yeah. <laughs> can, can you gather all that together and i can train a gpt on it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, see, and see if it can be as novel or creative i'm, I'm guessing my answer would be no <laughs> well i'm glad we're still there i'm glad we're still there and i hope i hope we're still there in in you know when, when my kids are my age you know and their kids are growing up and they they still can there's still a value on on their imagination, gentlemen. Yeah, I, I, clo uh, it, it, I'm going to let you proceed, Lawrence, from here. But uh, sure. clo closing thoughts after this comment, and we'll start with you, Lawrence. Yeah, sounds good. I mean, just to answer Robert, yeah. that I I'm I personally am convinced that that will be the case, and as the tools get more powerful. Um, it's the difference of a human imagination in using those tools becomes more important. Um, you know, anybody could make a film of a train coming at a screen, you know, um, uh, but not anybody could like make a story that resonates with people and a human imagination to make those to bring those stories to production quicker and cheaper and have more of them out there, I think, is going to be the key in entertainment as we go forward, much more than the technology. Yeah, I certainly hope you're right. I, you know, I have to believe so. That's why I got up in the morning. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Absolutely. Lawrence, um, what uh, uh, th this has been 
wonderful uh, tremendous uh, thanks for you coming on and and oh, talking with us uh, uh what um what would you like to, to say to close us out based on uh, everything that we have accumulated in this is that we've gone down a, a number of different tangents is if there is any single thought that you would like to leave us with. Yeah, I think I, I would leave it with the only thing to fear is fear itself. Uh, I think, you know, um, the, the human nature has always been one of, that's resistant to change and can to react to change with fear. And, um, so, and you, the more people there are out there doing what we are doing today, having conversations about this kind of thing, exchanging information and trying to understand our way through the problems, uh, the brighter the future will be. And uh, and I'll just leave with like a little joke, um, which is against the, that the, the sentiment that I just shared is I tend to I generally believe there's a lot more to fear from human ignorance than there is from machine intelligence. Understood. Robert. Oh, no, I look, I agree with everything. Uh, Lawrence just said, and I think, you know, the the negative physiological and mental effects of fear are are also problematic, you know, stress, stress is, uh, uh, causes a lot more problems than, than people realize. And, and so uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure worrying is, is, I'm quite sure worrying is not good for you. But I'm also still a little worried about the situation. And I wish we were, I wish I believed that there, that, that the right people and enough of the right people are having these conversations. Do you, do you feel Robert, that this, that this, uh, discussion, um, uh, what was, well, obviously I, I think you would think it was worth your time, but do you, do you think that, uh, this will improve your, your, do you think this has improved your understanding on the subject? Um, a little bit, yeah. And I mean, it's nice to hear the perspective that's coming from inside one of the companies. I, I and and also just you know uh, someone who I respect and and think is a smart person uh, speaking on the subject. But I I guess my hope is, um, you know, and in doing this conversation, why I was excited to have it is I I want people to do something about it. You know what I mean? Like I want them to not just have a conversation or even just say something on social media, but use use these uh, how they feel about this situation or these problems and go out and do something. I think that that's what, uh... what they do. I don't know whether it's write a letter or or go to a meeting or organize a group or talk to their leaders. I mean, it's 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 not something you can just passively allow to continue to happen. And you can't force someone to learn something, no. um, but you can present the information and hope that you can you can spark a notion in their heads to 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 want more, and yeah. that's what I wanted to do with this episode, and I think it's been achieved in spades. And thank you, gentlemen, so much, both of you, for for coming on and and discussing. Yeah, I mean, I, I've tried to write as many cautionary tales as I possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and scare the crap out of people while while entertaining them and i probably will continue to do so so well, i hope so watching them <laughs> absolutely <laughs> gentlemen thank you very much thanks thank a lot you, david thanks thank robert. pleasure lawrence appreciate you thank you thank lawrence you. maroney and robert c cooper uh this was a fascinating um discussion and uh, I hope you enjoyed it I, I think we could have gone easily on for uh, a couple more hours but uh, uh, thank you to Lawrence and Robert for coming on and uh, and discussing uh, uh, artificial intelligence with a little bit of a lens through Stargate uh, we have coming up a chat with a chatbot based on Jack O'Neill and that's coming in the next uh, 13 minutes here so I hope you all can uh, join us for that this is going to be interesting we're going to see just how close to Jack's personality uh, we can get based on this thing and we're going to have that uh, for you in just a few moments here then next week we have if I can get the right button figured out here. We have uh, a couple of uh, guests that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, Kate Hewlett uh, will be joining us once again. She played Jeannie Miller in Stargate Atlantis. She's joining us March the 18th at 12 noon Pacific. And then Robert Mosley, Malachi in Window of Opportunity, and uh, Reimer in uh, in Season 10, the episode where everyone falls asleep. Uh, that's going to be March 18th at 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. 
And uh, that's pretty much everything that we've got for you here. I really want to send a huge thank you out to my team, Tracy and Anthony, the moderators, for uh, for getting everyone's, everyone's questions over to me. I apologize that we couldn't get to everybody. Thanks so much to Summer, uh, Jeremy, and Reese as well, my moderating team. Linda Gategaber Fury, my producer, and my webmaster, Frederick Marku at Concepts Web. You guys make the show possible. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. Thanks again to Robert C. Cooper and Lawrence Maroney. We'll see you on the other side.